So a, a little bit of what am I doing here? <laughs> For those of you who don't, don't, don't know me, um, my name is Philip Buckholz. I'm a, uh, I have a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a cancer gene jock. Uh, basically, I do cancer genomics research at the University of South Carolina. And what that means is that I'm kind of an expert on all the ways that the human genome can get futzed with during your lifetime and which of those things cause cancer and which ones don't, okay? Um, so technically, that means that I'm very, very skilled in, in the art of DNA sequencing. Okay, I can figure out the sequence of things that I didn't know what I was looking for. Um, and I'm also pretty good, when I say I, I mean the people in my laboratory, uh, you're not gonna hear their names, but there's a group of people that do this excellent work. Um, we're really good at, at um, detecting foreign pieces of DNA in places where they're not supposed to be, even if they're real low levels. And we use those skills during the pandemic um, to, we invented the COVID test that many of you did a spit test. Okay, that came out of my lab because we were really good at that kind of stuff. And so I've earned a fair amount of respect um, in the state of South Carolina and in this body because we did a ton of COVID testing in the middle of the night when people were afraid and we told them, no, you don't have COVID in your home or yes, you do. So my qualifications to comment on this are both technical and kind of relational in the state of South Carolina. Um, I'll cut to a very narrow theme here, but it does touch on lots of these regulatory issues and I'll leave it to you to expand on those if you want to. I'll try to stay in this narrow lane um, of some problems in the Pfizer vaccine um, as a case study for places in which regulatory oversight could be improved, all right? So first of all, let me say that my interpretation of the literature is that the Pfizer vaccine did a pretty good job of keeping people from dying, but it did a terrible job of stopping the pandemic. The early publications showed that um, it stopped infection, but that only lasted for like a month. Dr. And, Burkhardt, yes. could you pull the mic a little closer to you? Um, staff's telling me they're having trouble getting you on the recording. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, in, in my professional evaluation of the literature, the Pfizer vaccine did a pretty good job of keeping people out of the cemetery, but it sucked at stopping the pandemic. And um, it was the best of sucky options that we had. And I still believe that um, it was deployed mostly in good faith, but there were a lot of shortcuts taken because the house was on fire and uh, we could do a better job next time from the lessons that we're gonna learn here. That's my own personal view of this, uh, but I'm also, my philosophical bent here is, I'm sure many of you have heard of Occam, Occam's razor, right? Choose the simplest of explanations. Well, there's another one called Hanlon's razor, which is never attribute malice to that which can be better explained by incompetence. And so I'm trying to be gracious here in many in circumstances. There could be malice underneath, but I'm trying to see just incompetence to be gracious. So the Pfizer uh, vaccine is contaminated with plasma DNA. It's not just mRNA. It's got bits of DNA in it. This DNA is the DNA vector that was used um, as the template for the in vitro transcription reaction when they made the mRNA. Um, I know this is true because I sequenced it in my own lab. The vials of Pfizer vaccine that were given out here in Columbia, uh, one of my colleagues was in charge of that vaccination program in the College of Pharmacy. And for reasons that I still don't understand, he kept every single vial. Um, so he had a whole freezer full of the empty vials. Well, the empty vials have a little tiny bit in the, in the bottom of them. He gave them all to me and I looked at them. We had two batches that were given out here in Columbia and I checked these two batches and I checked them by sequencing. And I sequenced all the DNA that was in the vaccine and I can see what's in there. And it's surprising that there's any DNA in there and you can kind of work out what it is and how it got there. And I'm kind of alarmed about the possible consequences of this, both in terms of human health and biology, but you should be alarmed about the regulatory process that allowed it to get there. So this DNA, in my view, it could be causing some of the rare but serious side effects like death from cardiac arrest. So there's a lot of cases now um, of people having suspicious 
death after vaccine. It's hard to prove what caused it. It's just, you know, temporally associated. Um, and this DNA is a plausible mechanism, okay? Uh, this DNA uh, can and likely will integrate into the genomic DNA of cells that got transfected with the vaccine mix. This is just the way it works. We do this in the lab all the time. We take pieces of DNA, we mix them up with a, a lipid complex like the Pfizer uh, vaccine is in. We pour it onto cells and, and a lot of it gets into the cells and a lot of it gets into the DNA of those cells and it becomes a permanent fixture of the cell. It's not just a temporary, um, a temporary thing. It is in that cell and all of its progeny from now on forevermore, amen. So that's why I'm kind of alarmed about this DNA being in the vaccine, it's, it's, it's different from RNA because it can be permanent. This is a real hazard for genome modification of long-lived somatic cells, like stem cells, um, and it could cause, theoretically, this is all a theoretical concern, but it's pretty reasonable based on solid molecular biology, that it could cause a sustained autoimmune attack toward that tissue. It's also a very real theoretical risk of future cancer in some people, depending on where in the genome this foreign piece of DNA lands, um, it can interrupt a tumor suppressor or activate an oncogene. I think it'll be rare, but I think the risk is not zero, and it may be high enough that we are to figure out if this is happening or not. And again, the, the, the autoimmunity thing is not my wheelhouse. I'm not an immunologist, but the cancer risk is. That's my bag. I know this is a thing, and it is a possibility. Okay. I'll, a little nerdy science here. The central dogma of molecular biology is that DNA gets transcribed into RNA, okay? And then RNA gets translated into protein. This is just how life runs. Why, why does this matter? Well, DNA, for the purposes of this discussion, DNA is a long-lived information storage device. Okay, what you were born with, you're gonna die with and pass on to your kids. DNA lasts for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and it can last for generations if you get, pass it on to your kids, right? So alterations to the DNA, they stick around. RNA, by its nature, is temporary. It doesn't last. And that feature of RNA was part of the sales pitch for the vaccine. The pseudouridine was supposed to make the RNA last a little bit longer, but still it's a transient phenomenon. We're talking hours to days, okay? Um, and then proteins. Once proteins are made, they also don't last forever. They, are, they last for hours to days. But something that makes its way into DNA has the potential to last for a very long time, maybe a lifetime. So this is a picture of the sequencing read that, uh, the sequencing run that I did uh, in the lab um, from a couple of batches of the Pfizer vaccine. And all those little bitty lines here are the little tiny pieces of DNA that are in the vaccine. They don't belong there. They are not part of the sales pitch or the marketing campaign, and they're there. There's a lot of them. This little graph here in the middle is the size distribution that peaks around 100 base pairs, 120 base pairs. So the, the DNA pieces that are in the vaccine are short little pieces, 100, 120. There's some that are about 500 base pairs, a few that are even 5,000, but most of them are around 100 base pairs. Um, why is this important? Because the probability of a DNA, piece of DNA integrating into the human genome is unrelated to its size. So your genome risk is just a function of how many particles there are. So it's like, you know, if you shoot a shotgun at a washboard, if you shoot a slug, you have some probability of hitting it. And if you shoot buckshot, you have a bigger probability of hitting it with some shot, right? This, all these little pieces of DNA that are in the vaccine are analogous to buckshot. Um, you have many, many thousands of opportunities to modify uh, a, a cell of a vaccinated person. Um, the pieces are very small because during the process, they chopped them up to try to make them go away, but they actually increased the hazard of genome modification in the process. That's how this got here. Um, in my view, uh, somebody should go about sequencing DNA samples from stem cells of people who are vaccinated and find out if this theoretical risk has happened or not. I think this is a real serious oversight, regulatory oversight 
that happened at the federal level, and somebody should force this to happen somewhere. Dr. Buckle, yes. if you allow, are you capable of doing that? Yeah, it's we do that kind of thing, but in order for it to be trustworthy it, by the public, this has to be done by lots of people. Right? Okay. Um, I'll talk to you more about that later. Yeah, this is our our deal. This is why I know this should have been done at the federal level. Okay. Um, so we took all these pieces of DNA and we used them to glue together what the source DNA must have been. This is kind of, again, this is our, what we do in the lab all the time. And, and all these little, little red and green lines here, these are all independent little pieces of DNA. Um, this must have had 100,000 pieces of DNA in this, this uh, sequencing run. And you can put them all back together and see what they came from is this circle over here. It's a plasmid that you can go shopping online to buy from Agilent. And it's clear that Pfizer uh, took this plasmid and then they cloned Spike into it. Um, and they used it for in a process called in vitro transcription translation, in vitro transcription, where you feed um, an RNA polymerase this plasmid and it makes a whole bunch of mRNA copies for you. Okay, and then you take this mRNA, you mix it with the, the lipid nanoparticle transfection reagent, and now you've got your mRNA vaccine, but they failed to get the DNA out before they did this. So these little pieces, they did, they did make some effort to chop it up, so all these little pieces of the plasmid got packaged in with the RNA. That's clear as day what happened just from the forensics of looking at the DNA sequencing. Okay, a, a little bit of a regulatory note here. Um, the way you do RNA transcription, in vitro transcription reactions, you have to give it a DNA template, okay? And you can give it a DNA template that is just a synthetic piece of DNA that is only the instructions to make the RNA. And that's what was done for getting the um, emergency use authorization and the clinical trial. It's called process one, if you look up that kind of stuff. Um, they made a PCR product of just the bits that they wanted, and then they did the in vitro transcription, made a bunch of RNA of that. There was no plasma DNA to contaminate the stuff that was used for the trial. But that, that making that PCR product doesn't scale the way that was necessary to vaccinate the whole world. So a cheaper way to scale up the production of this template is to clone that PCR product into this plasmid vector, put the plasmid vector into bacteria, and then you can grow up big vats of the bacteria. They make a lot of the plasmid DNA for you. Then you use that plasmid DNA as the template to drive this transcription reaction to make your RNA. Um, and that's where how the contamination ended up in the production batches, even though it was not in the stuff that was used for the authorization trials. So I know it's a little bit of nerdy science, but it has regulatory implications for, for you guys. <clears throat> um, we, can, we can measure the quantity of this stuff pretty easy in the lab. This is, we're, we're good at doing this kind of stuff. This is the same, we made a little PC. A colleague of mine at, at MIT made, you know, from who, who used to work for the the Broad Institute at MIT, he, he made a little uh, PCR test and we cloned it here. This is similar to the PCR test that you all took for the spit test. Okay, same, same idea and same expertise behind it. And we can quantify exactly how much of this stuff is in a vaccine or any other tissue. And, you know, I, I estimate that there were about 2 billion copies of the one piece that we're looking for in every dose. And if you look back at that map I showed you where it's all these little, the, the little piece that we're looking for is just that little bit right there, okay? But if you see 2 billion copies of this, there's about 200 billion of everything else. So w what this means is that there's probably about 200 billion pieces of this plasma DNA in, in each dose of the vaccine. And it's encapsulated in this lipid nanoparticle, so it's ready to be delivered inside the cell. Okay, this is a bad idea. My conclusions from this, um, we should check a bunch of people. Ah. My conclusions from this, or I should learn how to run PowerPoint. Um, we should check a bunch of vaccinated people getting tissue samples 
especially if we focus on harmed people, but that's not necessary. We could also just focus on regular unharmed people and see if this plasmid DNA is integrating into the genomes of any of their stem cells. It leaves a calling card that is there. One of the reasons why I'm focusing on this is because it's kind of different from a lot of the other imagined harms where you can't really prove it. You can be suspicious because of the timing, but you can't really prove it. This one, you can prove it because it leaves a calling card, okay? Um, you find it in the stem cells of harmed people, it's equivalent to finding a certain type of lid in someone who is now dead. It's pretty reasonable to assume that that's what caused it. Uh, the royal we, meaning you guys, should insist that the FDA force Pfizer to get the DNA out of the booster and all future versions of this vaccine. I'm a real fan of this platform, okay? I think it has the potential to treat cancers. I really believe that this platform is revolutionary and in your lifetime, there will be mRNA vaccines against antigens in your unique cancer, okay? And, but they gotta get this problem fixed, okay? And, I, and I, right now, I think the financial incentives are too great to just keep on rolling with it and it's gonna take some encouragement to get it out. The regulation that allowed this DNA to be there in the first place. I don't think that this, the amounts there actually exceed the regulation limits. In some batches it may. In, in the two batches that I looked at, one of them it was just under the limit and one it was just over the limit. My colleague in Boston has looked at a fair number of other batches and there's a handful that are super high and there's a handful that are super low. But the fact that there is a regulatory threshold for amount of DNA allowed in a vaccine is a throwback to an era when we were talking about vaccines that were like a recombinant protein that you, or a dead virus, you know, attenuated virus produced in, in CHO cells or something like that. And the DNA that might be in it is naked DNA. And you might have a little bit in the vaccine. That's not a problem because naked DNA gets chewed up immediately upon vaccination and there's no real mechanism for it to get inside the cells. They inappropriately applied that regulatory limit to this new kind of vaccine where everything is encapsulated in this lipid nanoparticle. It's basically packaged in a synthetic virus able to dump its contents into a cell. So I'm thinking Hanlon's razor here, okay? I don't think there was anything nefarious here. I think it was just kind of a dumb oversight. And it's gonna take, because the financial incentives are so great to just you know sweep it under the rug, and the career incentives of people that approve this are going to be, oh, there's nothing wrong here. You know, it's going to take some encouragement to make people prove that it's okay. But I really believe this was an inappropriate application of an old school regulation to a new kind of vaccine. And who knows, maybe we'll check a bunch of people and we'll find out for sure that this is indeed not a problem. And that will do the public good if we prove that. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Senator Cash. <clears throat> Doctor, we uh, appreciate all that you're saying, although we don't understand most of what you're saying. Sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I have a limited amount I of time. I hear someone so I didn't down know. there agreeing a lot, so you must have been a chemistry major or something. But um, what, what is going to help us is to know what, what you can do, like checking a bunch of vaccinated people. Of course, that's what I can do. Right. But, but uh, we are not going to have any authority over the, the FDA to force Pfizer to do something. I mean, that's a federal issue. Uh, yes. Unless you can explain to me how we could do something at a state level, you know, some of this is going to have to be taken up by our congressman, right? So just whatever your remaining comments are, just keep in mind that I understand what what we can do and and really these technical things you're throwing at us as, as the senator from Greenville has already mentioned we're going to throw right back at you because there's no you're the expert so if someone's going to do this testing uh, I don't know who we would find to do it 
Well, th- other than someone like you, I, I can do it. Lots of other people can do it. Um, I've had a lot of of um, so coroners and pharmacists from different states contact me. I posted all this on Twitter, right? And so people will private message me and say, "I'd like to send you some samples." And then they say, "Oops, state le- regulations will not allow our coroner to send any samples for this." So there are some policy issues that can allow this to happen or impede it. I don't know what they are, but I hear that there are mechanisms in place that will, you know, you can encourage people to do things or not do things, but that's your wheelhouse, not mine. All I can tell you is what I found in the lab and the scientific implications of it, the policy implications and what to do with it is out of my, it's above my pay grade. Mr. Senator Um, Garrett. Thank you for coming today. Um, I think I followed most of what you said. President Biden said the other day that there was a new uh, COVID vaccine that, and this one really works. Um, There's no evidence to that as far as I I can tell. I I understand that, and that's why I'm asking this question. Is there some way you could get a hold of one of those and do the same same study that you did on these vials to make sure that we're not using that, that DNA protein or whatever it is that the DNA that, that, that we don't need in, uh, to be injected into these uh, to our constituents. I would like to do that, and I will not get it unless I get a batch and, t- and find out that it's free of DNA, and then I'll take it myself. I mean, but I don't, I don't have any way of compelling that to happen. So it was just basically a way to save money by, by doing it in such volume that way without then taking it back out later on? I think nobody thought about it. I think it was reasonable to use the E. coli to blow up the plasmid to make the stuff. And then the, the pieces of the DNA are of a very uniform and small size. That's evidence that they took efforts to try to chop it up. And well, then they knew about it. Yeah, yeah, they knew it. And they took efforts to chop it up. They just didn't get it all out. But, but having and said that. I guess that they just didn't think about the the hazard for genome modification because it's not all that expensive to add another process to get it out. Well, that's what I'm saying. I, it, it, you know, I can't get inside rushed, their mind. This I don't was know. rushed too much, and that's why I'm saying these subsequent. You know, we've heard testimony of these subsequent. You know, variant subsequent uh, boosters, et cetera, et cetera, are leading to maybe not scientific yet, but at least collateral knowledge that it apparently these things are causing death and disability later on and also the aging process which you heard about a few minutes there's a lot of suspicious associations but i but it seems to me that that before we can in south carolina you know give this new vaccine a whirl around here seems to me that that our people ought to be able to look at that mr chairman and see whether or not it's got this DNA. And if it does, fine, tell everybody it's got the DNA and the, and the problems associated therewith. And then you got informed consent. Correct. Okay, but without that, we it don't have not informed, informed consent. consent. I'm, not, I'm not really happy about that, Mr. Chairman, and do what I can to try to help. Uh, N- knowing what I know, otherwise. Knowing what I know now about this, I would still have recommended it to my elderly parents, okay. but I probably would not have given it to my daughters. Okay. And I, I feel like my consent was not as informed as it should have been. Thank you. Yeah, Representative Morgan. I almost don't know where to start. I'm, I'm trying not to talk because we're, it's a hearing and we want to hear you, but I, you have made so many questions come to my mind. Um, and one I should know, but I don't remember. What percentage of vaccinated people had this kind of vaccination? Do you know off the top of your head? Like the majority of people that took the vaccine have this type, because weren't there multiple types of vaccinations you could take? The vast majority of people got either Pfizer or Moderna. And, and we're talking about the I'm Pfizer. I'm talking about Pfizer. My colleagues have looked at Moderna, and it's in Moderna, too. In the few that we've looked at, it's just not quite as high. Okay, wow. Um, um, wait, so you were here today, and you've come to present, and you noticed this. Where could you have gone if we didn't have this kind of ad hoc hearing nowhere. for this to come? Twitter. So there's no you, there's, DHAC, yeah. there's no way no. for you, even at your yeah. level of expertise, to say, hey, red flag. I, I, email, I emailed the FDA and I tweeted at them. That's about the extent of my resources. Yeah. It's just and, fascinating to me that in, a, in the state that we don't have some kind of 
um, I guess it goes to kind of the entire thing that we're talking about is that our state agency should have more focus on our citizens' health. And, you know, it's great. CDC can send us stuff, but we'll make the decision. And, and there should be a way for, especially at your level, to get input to DHEC when you notice something like this immediately and say, hey, DHEC, you should consider this. And then they can come and tell us immediately, hey, we need to get authorization. Or you need to change this regulation to look into this. And it just seems like we've totally dropped the ball in every direction with the state prioritizing um, you know our decision making on this kind of stuff and, and investigating into it just letting the you know the federal government take it and do a terrible job so i had a lot of experience with DHEC rolling out the saliva test okay so we invented the saliva test and then we had to deal with DHEC to try to get it rolled out for the state and it appeared to me that they were just overrun they weren't prepared for what this pandemic was and it's no fault of theirs. I thought I, I told people at the time that I felt like these were hobbits in the Shire that were, uh, you know, accustomed to taking care of small problems, and now all of a sudden we're in the War of the Ring, and there are orcs at the gate, and we're expecting them to deal with this tremendous challenge. And that's not who we put there, and that's not their fault. I mean, it's just we were not prepared to handle something of this magnitude. So some amount of grace, I think, is appropriate, even though we could do better next time by beefing up who's guarding the gates. If you if you had a, a tomorrow uh, the, uh, fixes to the system, what would they be <laughs> that we could? That's that your job, man. I don't policy? know. I, I, but I, I mean, since you lived it and ha and saw based on the research, should we have somebody actually checking up, especially on something that is being pushed statewide? I mean, state resources so are being hire, used saying to take this vaccine. You have to hire people that are qualified to tell the feds no. And that's not what we do here usually in South Carolina. We hire people. Sometimes we say to the no to the feds just to be ornery because that's our culture in South Carolina. But many times we say, well, I don't know. What do other people do? And we hire people all over that they ask, well, what does Clemson do? What does USC? Well, what do they do over in this other state? Instead of putting people in place that we would have confidence in saying no to, the, to whatever the recommendations were, we put people in that we often encourage them to not make too many waves and just go ask the feds what they're doing. And that's not their fault. That's the culture that we cultivated. So I know that South Carolina culture is, no, 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 we're going to do our own thing. But in reality, in terms of actually doing stuff, almost always we people will say, well, what do they do else in another state? Or what are they doing at the fed level? And I'll just go along with it. Would it be, and I'm not a medical professional by any stretch, would it be realistic for anything that is being promoted, especially on a large scale, a vaccination that's you know coming from who knows where, to have it, it be investigated by people in our state, such as yourself? Or is that, would it that was, be too... It was reasonable to trust the FDA, even though I have my doubts about their independence now. Everybody just trusted the feds to do this, and at the time, that was kind of reasonable. But going forward, I get that's my question. Going forward, is it is it possible? Is it reasonable for us to be able to have a system where we could, especially if it's been, if the taxpayer money is going to be used to push it and tell people to get it, that we have it set up that it's automatically tested, basically, or looked into by scientists and medical professionals in our state to determine uh, maybe it's in DHEC. Maybe DHEC has that where they are required to look into it and have their own, um, you know, summary or decision on whether or not it's safe and effective, since we know that CDC and uh, FDA and all these are not doing a good job with it. And I, and I guess I'm asking you as a professional, are you, do you hear that and think, wow, that's going to cost an insane amount of money and good luck? Or no, is no, it like, no, I, I that's don't think reasonable. It, no, no, the, the actual, like, Scientific experiments are, I don't think, an insane amount of money. It's having the, the regulatory and, and financial independence to like say, no, we're not going to do it the way we're told until we find out that it's okay, when in reality, much of our support comes from federal sources. It's like if you have a better idea for how to build the interstate, you kind of have to do what the, the federal people tell you. Regardless, right? We because that's where the money comes from for a lot of the inf interstate infrastructure, and I think I'm not a policy expert, but I I think that a lot of financial support through the healthcare system 
and, and elsewhere was tied to compliance to the federal narratives. And so I don't know that you can create true independence. You, you could maybe create some kind of oversight that would enhance the public trust in whether it was a good idea or not. But that's a different matter from us being able to go our own way all the time. Mm -hmm. But Which that's you your least... that's your leader. That's your area of expertise, not mine. Yeah, but it is but it is possible to have somebody look into vaccinations and do similarly yes. to what you did. This on this I did this went. on my own money with free student. I mean, yeah, we this is not terribly expensive to do these kinds of tests. Right. But you know, there has to be in a system that that professors are not going to be penalized for producing results that are counter to what the party line is supposed to be. And that you can create bubbles of where the protection for people whose job it is to check things. And if they come up with answers that nobody likes, they can still say them. And, and you have to create these kind of protection bubbles. What's well, chairman? Yes. Okay. Ask him just a few more questions. Okay. Doctor, have you, are you planning to publish these findings? Have you tried to publish these findings in a journal? No and no. They're not. As of now, they are interesting and concerning, but not. they don't rise to the level of a peer-reviewed publication. The most likely, uh, the best possible outcome would be that I would check a bunch of people find out it never integrated and this is not a problem and then it will never be published because papers don't publish negative results. Kind of the worst outcome is I can check a bunch of people and I find, oh, it integrated and it's causing these horrible things and yeah, then I'll get a paper and be famous. Um, but I'm hoping that that's not the way it goes. So you see how they're in academia for publication, there are all these perverse incentives in place where the kind of thing you need to be done is is the kind of thing that does not generate a publication. You need a regulatory body to check, find no problem, and tell the public, there's no problem, we checked, and there ain't nothing there. That will never get published, you know, or very seldom. It's hard to publish negative results like that. And that's why academic science is not the best place to do it. How long would it take to do what it is you're talking about here, about check a bunch of vaccinated people? I mean, I. It's it's hard for me listening to all this for the first time to to uh, calculate how alarmed you are and whether, in your personal opinion, you would hit the pause button on allowing this new vaccine, so to speak, without knowing more. How long does it take, and and how serious is it to to find out this information before people keep taking these vaccines? It it takes about three hours to check a vial of vaccine to see if it's got this in it. About a hundred bucks of reagents. And I'm not going to get it unless I find a, a vial that I can check ahead of time and make sure it's not there. And if it is there, I'll take a pass on it. Thank you. Well, doc, Dr. Bookhoff, thank you so much for being here. And I would like to say that um, I would sort of, in the world of COVID that we've been dealing with, with all the lies and cover-ups and misinformation out there, I would almost call you a whistleblower. Um, and Dr. Lead, I think we may have found our state's Surgeon General here. No, <laughs> that's not my. But, thank, thank you for but, your confidence in but, me, but that's but beyond. What I my would end. like to say is, as we wrap it up, is I do appreciate you. Um, I understand um, where you uh, are employed, and um, you and I have had a little conversation about how wonderful tenure is and things like that. But if you experience any retribution or any harassment for coming forward at this hearing and testifying, would you please let us know? Because I can assure you, you will have an army behind you to help with whatever may come your way. Thank you very much. <laughs> Rep. Morgan easy. has one more I'm question. So sorry, I, and we've got to move along. Doc, Dr. Uh, Jancy is, uh, I think, under a time constraint. I should have well. asked this. So you didn't, uh, have, you haven't interacted with DHEC about this specific? No, no. Okay. I was just wondering if you had any. I interacted with some a couple of people at the FDA. I just sent them emails and said, "Hey, you want to? You should look in this." Okay. 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, next is Dr. Uh, Jancy Lindsay. 